Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. My name is Tony Cully Foster. I have the honor of being President and CEO of the World Affairs Council, Washington, DC. On behalf of our council, I welcome you to tonight's ambassador series. We're particularly pleased to have a great board. And in addition to Mark Albert, who's on stage here tonight as our discussant, we have here tonight with us some of our board members. So Ambassador Laura Kennedy, please stand. Oh, come on, that was a very anemic round of applause. <laughs> God, this is Ambassador Kennedy, for God's sake. <clears throat> Laura uh, is an experienced ambassador, was in on all sorts of nuclear and disarmament talks throughout her illustrious career, and she is vice chair of our International Affairs Committee. We thank our strategic partners at the Ronald Reagan Building International Trade Center for their wonderful hospitality and for providing us with this beautiful venue to hold all of our public programs. We do th about 32, 36 programs here during the course of the year, and we're very fortunate to have a great strategic partnership with the Ronald Reagan Building International Trade Center team. The World Affairs Council is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to facilitating collaboration throughout the global education and international affairs community. We do this by developing informed geopolitical insights and critical thinking with a global perspective through our providing programs to educate, enlighten, and empower students, educators, professionals, the American public, and the international community, which is represented here tonight by the distinguished ambassador of Armenia. Our programs are filmed for nationwide broadcast on our one hour weekly television show, World Affairs Today, which airs at 3 p.m. on Sunday afternoons on MHC Network's Worldview channel. Our programs are also distributed globally on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and other digital platforms. Tonight, we welcome to our gathering the nation of Armenia, which is a small land-linked country nestled in the Lesser Caucasus mountain range of the Caucasus. Our event will focus, focus on Armenia's relationship with the United States and the role that it plays in Europe, but also in terms of its relationship with the United States. The Armenian flag was adopted in 1990. It's a tricolor, just like the Irish flag, with three horizontal bars colored red, blue, and orange. Although there are many interpretations of the symbolism of the flag's colors, the Armenian constitution states, the red stripe represents blood shed for liberty by the Armenian people. The blue stripe represents hope and the will of the Armenian people to live beneath peaceful skies. The orange symbolizes the land and the courage of the workers and citizens who farm it. In the Middle Ages, Armenia became the first kingdom to officially adopt Christianity in 301 AD, 36 years before the Emperor Constantine of Rome was baptized as a Christian. In 1260, Armenia was invaded by the Mongols. This hastened the decline of the kingdom and eventually led to Western Armenia being ruled by the Ottoman sultans and Eastern Armenia being ruled by the Iranian dynasties from the 14th century to the early 20th century. With the onset of the First World War, the Ottoman Empire instituted a policy of forced resettlement of Armenians to the Syrian desert. This, this policy, coupled with other harsh practices, resulted in at least one million Armenian deaths. The Armenian state maintains that its people were victims of genocide. However, Turkey, the United Nations, and the UN 
have yet to formally acknowledge this action. The end of World War I saw the declaration of the First Armenian Republic, which lasted from 1918 through 1920. 1920 saw the annexation of Armenia by the Soviet Union, and it remained under Soviet rule until the collapse of the USSR in 1991. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, Armenia found itself embroiled in territorial disputes with the neighboring nation of Azerbaijan. The conflict led to the creation of the autonomous Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, a country that remains largely unrecognized by the rest of the global community. The conflict led to Turkey and Azerbaijan closing their borders to all Armenian traffic and trade. In terms of its relationship with the US, the US established diplomatic relations with Armenia in 1992, following its independence from the Soviet Union. The US has a stated interest in the reopening of the borders of Armenia with Azerbaijan and Turkey, as well as helping to resolve the Nagorno-Karabakh dispute to promote peace and stability in the region. Trade and investment between Armenia and the US has been further strengthened by the signing of several trade agreements. These include a trade and investment framework agreement, TIFA, signed in 2015, as well as the investment incentive agreement and bilateral investment treaty agreement both of which were signed in 1992. His Excellency Grigor Hovassian. His Excellency has had a successful career in the Armenian Foreign Service. It has spanned over a decade. He was born in Yerevan, the capital of Armenia, and was appointed ambassador to the United States in January 2016. And I'm going to stop at this moment and recognize Ambassador's wife and their beautiful daughter. Please stand up. Thank you for both coming to make sure Ambassador gives a great speech tonight. Okay. Prior to his current appointment, Ambassador served as a representative of his country to Mexico, Panama, Costa Rica, Cuba, Guatemala from 2014 to 2016. Ambassador has also had an exceptional career working with the United Nations. In 1994, he served as the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in Yerevan, Armenia. In 1996, he was stationed with the UN Special Mission to the African Great Lake Lakes region. In 1998, head of Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Brazzaville, Republic of Congo, uh, U.S. Secretariat Offices for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. He then went on to be field coordinator in the Palestinian territories, 2002-2003. His last appointment with the U.N. was in 2004 as senior advisor to the Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General at the United Nations Assistance Mission to Iraq in Jordan. After his extensive career with the United Nations, he began his career in Armenia's foreign policy in 2009 as his country's Consul General in Los Angeles. We are, welcome, we are honored to welcome him here to our podium tonight. And now to the rascal in the room, our discussant for tonight is Mark Albert, Chairman of the Board of Directors Nominating Committee. He's a senior lawyer with a distinguished law firm here in Washington, D.C., a partner at Stinson Leonard Street, LLP. He is Chairman of the Bankruptcy and Creditors' Rights Department of his firm, so I'm delighted that you're all meeting him socially tonight. He maintains an AV rating from Martindale Hubble. He's listed in the best lawyers in America for bankruptcy and creditor, uh, debitor, rights. Prior to joining Stinson, Mr. Albert was litigation counsel with the tax division of the US Department of Justice. He's also someone who has a lifelong ambition to appear in Hollywood receiving an Oscar. He may 
may get the silver medal by getting an Emmy or a Tony, but he's a talented amateur playwright and actor. So watch him closely tonight. And we'll then have a, a, a poll in the audience to see how you think he performed. Ma Mark is passionate about education and the DC community. He serves on many volunteer board roles at George Washington University, which is his alma mater. He serves on the Council for Columbian College and the Me Medical Faculty Associates. He's also an avid world traveler. He was so taken six, seven weeks ago with the warm reception that he got at the home, the residence of the ambassador of Armenia and his wife, that three weeks later, he went to Armenia to prepare for this tonight. So if anyone's interested in travel arrangements for Armenia, there's your man. Please join me in a warm welcome for His Excellency Grigor Hovassian, Ambassador of Armenia, and Mark Albert, our discussant. Hey, what a pleasure it is to have you, Your Excellency, here tonight. And um, we most um, thank you and appreciate your taking the time tonight. And we enjoyed meeting your lovely wife and child as well as well, uh, before you joined the Foreign Service and became ambassador of the Republic of Armenia to the United States, you worked with the United Nations for many years, an organization that I admire. What inspired you to pursue a career with the United Nations? Thank you very much for the question. But first of all, perhaps uh, with your permission, I would first greet uh, this, this wonderful audience. You know, I'm, I'm so humbled to see your enthusiastic participation, I never expected to have uh, these many of you. Uh, colleagues, practitioners, uh, uh, community members, thank you very much. I, I hope we, uh, we meet your expectations. And although now I know it's a uh, discussant's performance is that, that to be judged, not mine. Uh, <laughs> and, and yet, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll do my best to, uh, to come out sincere and, uh, um, uh, and, and forthcoming. Uh, I thank you for your first question. Uh, 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 I was very fortunate to, to start my professional career with United Nations. UN was my first employer in my life. Uh, for a very young man to, to join that uh, huge organization and, and stay in that uh, organization at the headquarters and the field level in various adventures, uh, uh, it shaped my life. It made, it made me what, what I am now. Uh, and even though I, I, I joined the government, I'm a, I'm a civil servant, I'm a diplomat now, I do have that perspective of a globalist, of internationalist, and I do uh, watch all international news, uh, uh, and I don't glance in, in the news, newspapers. I read everything is out there, uh, from Myanmar to, to Benin. You know, everything is, is part of my life. Uh, uh, and that's what uh, uh, that's the byproduct of of, uh, of United Nations. Uh, uh, I joined uh, the system when I was very young, uh, and the system uh, treated me um, uh, nicely. Uh, uh, I, I was in, uh, involved in uh, most crises uh, uh, of the uh, post Cold War uh, era. Uh, those crises uh, that marked. Uh, um, the, the political uh, map of the world, but those were uh, that was romantic time of globalization, uh, of, of of change. Uh, things are slightly different now, uh, but that period of the post Cold War era, uh, in in which unfortunately there were uh, uh, many crises, uh, marked me, marked uh, uh, made me what I am now, and uh, uh, and I'm very fortunate to to have that uh, uh, background. This is what I brought to our National uh, Foreign Service. Oh, thank you, and just to follow up there, you were, as I recall, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in Armenia in the years 1994 through 1996. How did that refugee crisis affect your country at that time, and how did that prepare Armenia in addressing the current immigration crisis in Europe in particular? Just like uh, her ambassador in Washington, Armenia is a, is a strange bird as a, as a country. You know? <laughs> uh, we're young uh, and we were uh, uh, shaped by refugee uh, migration. A little bit like United States, but uh, differently. You know? uh, 
Uh, we first became a republic 100 years ago. We'll be celebrating the birth of the first Armenian Republic next year. Uh, and, the, and the wreckages of two empires, uh, surviving a genocide and uh, exclusion and annihilation, uh, rhetoric from Ottoman Empire and uh, all sorts of violence and atrocities. You know, Armenians, uh, some of them, those who, who, who were lucky enough to, to survive, converged in a very small uh, piece of land, which became the Republic of Armenia, entirely made of refugees. So this is a country of refugees that was born, born 100 years ago. Uh, and unfortunately, that, uh, uh, that logic of migration and forced migration continued uh, uh, as Armenia matured gradually. Uh, when we became independent again uh, after the collapse of Soviet Union in 1991, uh, you know, the wreckages of Soviet empire, that, that there were many, many conflicts that led to uh, forced migration, displacement of the refugees, and a tiny country of three million people that is the, the, roughly the size of Rhode Island received a, 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 about 300,000 uh, uh, refugees who fled uh, Soviet Azerbaijan, some Central Asian uh, republics, other conflicts in Soviet, uh, ex-Soviet Union. So imagine a small country that barely survives, receives uh, a 10% increase in, in its population overnight. 300,000 people fleeing. So I was, uh, uh, because I was part of the independence uh, generation, we were uh, active, we were volunteering our time, we're trying to be helpful to our country. So I was into helping uh, receive refugees. Um, uh, and, and, and Armenia continued as a country, as a, as a custodian, as a, as a safe haven for refugees and country that believes in uh, humanitarianism, believes that people who flee for, for the fear of their life and, and uh, for the sake of uh, their kids' future need to be received and protected. Uh, and Armenia continued receiving refugees all these years. The Middle Eastern crisis was no exception, uh, although the country we never managed to become spectacularly rich, I mean, in 25 years of independence. We're okay, we're up and running, we're a viable country, but, uh, but we're not uh, uh, strong enough to, to provide uh, uh, comprehensive assistance to refugees the way that these people deserve. Uh, anyway, uh, Armenia, uh, in the wake of uh, the, the latest um, Middle East crisis, uh, has been receiving refugees, particularly minorities. Uh, particularly Christian minority, minorities that, that were particularly uh, targeted by uh, violence and exclusion. So we've been receiving uh, refugees from Iraq, Syria, uh, Armenians, non-Armenians, Assyrians, Yazidis. Uh, uh, over 22,000 of them were received in Armenia and sheltered over the last few years. Uh, and that's a remarkable thing because uh, Arme that thus making Armenia the third uh, largest per capita uh, Middle East refugee recipient country. I'm very proud of that. You know, we're not uh, refugees are not uh, are not always satisfied with the quality uh, uh, of uh, life they're offered in the, in their new country. Uh, uh, from my UN days, I remember the refugees have no mercy, but it's fine. We should be understanding because uh, they went through such such horrible uh, ordeal, uh, left behind their lives. Uh, they, uh, they fled for their lives. Um, that's it, we, I, I, I wish we could have done more for them, but uh, you know, for, for this, the, the lim limited capacity that we have, I think we've done uh, uh, quite well. That's very good, thank you, sir. If you, you, know, you, you mentioned um, the genocide, um, but I also recall, and this is interesting to me, because about six months ago, I interviewed the ambassador from Rwanda and I believe you spent, what, two years serving on the UN special mission to the African Great Legion, Lakes region, following the Rwanda genocide. What are some of the key issues you dealt with in post-conflict society in the region? It was a very cruel thing for UN to, to do, to, to, to start with. They sent me to, because I spoke French and I was involved in refugee uh, affairs, they sent me to, to the Great Lakes region that was uh, plagued in the aftermath of Rwandan genocide. Uh, so a, a young man that comes from uh, genocide survival's uh, background, you know, genocide defines our uh, identity. And uh, 
and, and all of a sudden I find myself in the middle of yet another ongoing genocide in Rwanda. It's aftermath, actually. Uh, I arrived to uh, what was then the, the Eastern Zaire. Uh, now it's called the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, a country where uh, the, the forces, the negative forces, that was a legal definition, that had per perpetrated the Rwandan genocide had fled after the uh, law and order were restored in genocide. So these people who had uh, months ago killed uh, 800,000 uh, uh, civilians, innocent people, uh, fled to the neighboring country uh, in a rainforest to flee the, the justice, you know, to uh, escape, you know. Uh, and what happened, they fled with their families, entire villages. From the genocide was a very uh, ugly story, actually. Uh, I mean, it was very difficult to identify who were, there were no perpetrators per se. The entire uh, illness of society uh, translated into, you know, uh, even kids and even priests, even, you know, uh, People who would never be uh, exposed to, uh, uh, I mean, theoretically, uh, to inter-ethnic conflict, uh, they took part in it. Uh, and that was very ugly. So they left en masse, you know. They left, uh, they fled to Rwanda and with families, where, with cattle, you know. Uh, and they found in themselves in a, in a, in a terrible situation. Uh, dying of disease and in the rainforest of, of malaria and other diseases. So United Nations comes in, you know. Uh, technically, those are the uh, bad guys uh, who committed the genocide, uh, who need to be brought to the justice. On the other hand, you see these uh, civilian-looking people, you know, with their uh, families, with their uh, little kids. What do you do? I mean, humanitarian, uh, you know, imperative, save lives now versus the justice. Uh, and justice needs to be served because uh, other, if, if it goes unpunished, uh, you know, uh, this will tend to uh, repeat itself. So I was in the middle of that debate, whether to, to let these people disappear, uh, do, does the international community have the right to let that happen, or uh, stabilize and you know, uh, pick up the, the perpetrators, the vicious criminals, bring, bring to, the, the, to, the, to the court uh, uh, the United Nations was, was running a, a tribunal in Arusha for Rwanda genocides. So that was a very complex environment in, in which I found myself. Uh, it was a very traumatizing experience. Uh, that post-Rwandan genocide, Rwandan genocide continues to, to take toll on the, the entire neighborhood. Several countries were thrown in disarray as a result of this cross-border movement of, of, of people uh, and their victims. Uh, so the situation continues to be tragic. I continue to follow what, what's going on in Congo and other Great Lakes region and, and uh, 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 countries. Uh, but that's, uh, you know, experience. that's the experience I, I, I really uh, wanted to. to uh, now, make. following up on that, I know this is a very painful subject, but tell us about present relations with Turkey and your prognosis for your country to have better relations with them. Turkey, um, I know that genocide took place in 1915. Is there a way that um, Turkey and Armenia will ever reconcile this terrible tragedy? I do believe uh, that we need to uh, reconcile with Turks. Turkey is our neighbor, and uh, you're not going to change the uh, geography. The neighborhood's going to be the same. But what needs to be done in order to, to this to be achieved is, is uh, for Turkish society, for Turkey, for the government to come to face the past uh, so that it does not repeat itself, um, so that the Turkish society uh, uh, gets rid of the complexes, so that the Turkey becomes a, a, a large nation, uh, talented, endowed with uh, many uh, 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 talents and assets, uh, becomes uh, a country that bridges, you know, uh, smaller na nations around, this becomes a center of interaction of trade. Turkey is in, in, in a futile uh, a nationalistic uh, uh, denialism. 100 years ago, uh, there were 3 million, 2 million Armenian living in the historic homeland, uh, uh, Armenian homeland. Armenian presence in that part of the world was continuous for millennia. 
after the genocide, there were no Armenians left in that, uh, uh, in, in that area. There's no other proof, historic or like uh, scientific, there, there's no way we, we, we're gonna go into this kind of uh, rhetoric. Uh, Turkish society knows that there's this, this tremendous uh, uh, um, uh, stain in its uh, collective uh, memory, its collective uh, conscious, uh, and that needs to be addressed for the sake of Turks, for the sake of Armenians. Uh, we need to move on. Uh, and the, the nationalism, denying and uh, mounting uh, campaigns, uh, rewriting uh, um, uh, textbooks, uh, uh, and, burning archives, uh, uh, you know, going against the collective memory of all the other nations. All major nations in the world have uh, a huge body of evidence of, of the genocide from day one. United Nations, the United States including, uh, the, the extensive uh, archives uh, also exist with, uh, in Vatican and other countries. So uh, this nationalism, which is self-destroying, self-inflicting uh, uh, all sorts of uh, diseases on Turkish society, needs to cease. You need, they need to understand our point. You know. Uh, a small nation that was uh, on the verge of extinction 100 years ago now fa uh, faces this uh, denialism and bullying. You know, the world has just now realized that, that uh, how can uh, how can acute can be that the Turkish bullying be? We've been facing it from from day one. You know, uh, uh, and that's uh, we need. We think that something that needs to be addressed within the Turkish society for the Turk for for the sake of Turkey uh, herself. Uh, uh, in an, in an ideal world, we would have a great nation of Turkey uh, with whom we would uh, trade, uh, uh, enjoy the riches, uh, the nature, and you know, uh, whatever it, uh, it is endowed with. But there's things to be, the steps to be taken. And I, uh, I, I repeat, I, I can't stress it enough. It is important, it is cr critically important for us, but it's also critically important for the Turkish society. Look where they are now. That 20, 15 years ago, they were practically democratic country, a model for us as we became the independent and where they are now. Um, uh, and, and recognizing that the wrong is one way of improving and preventing that from recurring. That's a good answer, thank you. Um, ambassador, uh, as ambassador, I believe your job is to observe uh, Washington politics. What do you, what do you, <laughs> What do you tell your countrymen today about politics in the United States? Um, and does the internet and TV take away your job, or in some ways it helps you in explaining the current events in the United States? Uh, from Armenia, uh, from, from Yerevan's perspective, we look at the United States. The United States is not a nation state. This is, a, this is something, in, something different. This is... Uh, uh, um, it's not a Westphalian state that we have uh, in many uh, in, in, in Europe in the old uh, uh, world. This country is, is dear to Armenians because we have uh, uh, obviously uh, a community almost two million strong. It, also, it is also dear because UN uh, United States came to the rescue of Armenians. You know, uh, we spoke about the genocide. Uh, those who survived, particularly the orphans, 125,000 Armenian orphans, were handpicked by U.S. missionaries and placed in orphanages, rescued, and you know that that constitutes the core of uh, Armenian American community. So we look at the U.S. as we have something where we're kind of we have the buy-in. You know, it's something dear. Uh, it's not <coughs> indifferent. You know, as uh, some faraway place, and some look at. What, what is going in the U.S. In, uh, with admiration, some in disbelief, some, but there's a sense of that there's fundamental changes in, in, in Washington, as we all know. Uh, so obviously, uh, the, the pre-electoral uh, electro year and the, the past uh, months, there's been lots of reporting for me, back and forth, you know, because, uh, there's, there's new things happening. There's major rethinking, and uh, some of the things, I mean, I'm, I'm a Western-educated person. Some of the things I was taught at uh, the Fletcher School, for instance, <laughs> are now being questioned, you know. Uh, 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 the very foundations of uh, liberalism, trade, and, you know, soft power, these things are being uh, 
uh, uh, reconsidered, changed, uh, and uh, obviously uh, my, my country needs to be uh, on the same page. Uh, U.S. is a superpower. Things, uh, decisions made in, in, in Washington affect uh, the region, the, uh, the security environment, international trade, and, and that. So I, uh, um, well, I, without giving particular characterizations, uh, our job was to to bring to the to the, the public back home the uh, the debate, the essence of uh, fundamental changes. Uh, some of it is is uh, pretty welcome development for us. Uh, we are now uh, beginning a transition from uh, uh, an aid-based uh, bilateral relations to trade and economic, which is a very, uh, perhaps it is, it, it happened uh, a little bit uh, drastically, but it's good for, uh, for us to change the narrative. You know, there's much more beyond the basic technical cooperation. Uh, Armenia is now up and running and is a, is a viable country and would like to engage with, uh, with the U.S. on a, on a, on a partnership basis, uh, create uh, instruments for trade, uh, do uh, more uh, kind of uh, um, uh, exchanges of economic and, and scientific and academic character uh, more than uh, aid that was the, uh, the case previously. Thank you. I, I can't resist, though. I have to ask, do folks at home in Armenia ask you about um, President Trump and CNN and and the various intrigues that are going on. I mean, every day is as you and I talked about before. It's breaking news. I thought I had answered that question. You know, like <laughs> when, when, uh, when the diplomats are taught to to say nothing, especially, especially when they speak. And, uh, and this is what I, no, obviously we do we do report. Uh, on every single major issue, uh, not every single tweet, but uh, <laughs> big issues need to be uh, uh, reported immediately. Uh, CNN is there. CNN effect is is, uh, but 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 we our, our people need to know that there's there's life beyond CNN. I mean, uh, <coughs> we didn't know that. We thought CNN was uh, the epitome reflection of the whole political debate, which it is not, as we all know now. So now, I, uh, pending uh, such time as as Fox and others are being also broadcast in Armenia. I fill in those those gaps. Uh, uh, I I have the feeling that we did a relatively reasonable job in in, in convey, relaying you know uh, what is going here uh, at, at the at the Congress. Uh, obviously, people are very very worried about the uh, this uh, tense uh, U.S. Russia relations, uh, and those uh, those nuances are very important for us to to, to relay back. And you know, I even sometimes fly uh, uh, back home to. When I feel there's no enough uh, attention paid to uh, to my reports, so I, uh, I make an effort to go and uh, report in person on those things. You you raise a, thank you. You raise a good question. I meant to ask, what is the present? You know, I know you left the Soviet Union, your country, Armenia. What is the present relationship with um, Armenia and Russia and Mr. Putin and and Armenia? Armenia is a. Uh, uh, Obviously, it's an ex-Soviet uh, republic uh, and uh, lives in a, in a region where Russia, as a, as a regional power, is, is, is very present. With Russia, we have uh, strategic military relations. We trade with Russia. Uh, and uh, those relations are, are, are profound and institutional. But, as I said, uh, Armenia is a, is a, uh, is a, is a, uh, is a strange bird, uh, like her ambassador. Uh, so we do uh, have also very good relations with uh, Europe, uh, with which we're going to be signing a, a profound integration agreement, and we're very good uh, relations with the United States. So we do believe that even at the time when the, uh, the conflicts uh, are acute, uh, uh, antagonisms are, uh, are everywhere, like uh, uh, we want to become a territory, a country, and partner that brings together. Not uh, uh, is not a, a place where the div dividing li line uh, uh, runs through. Uh, we do believe that we will be able. We, we used to call it a policy of complementarity. Now we call it a multi-vector policy. We do believe because uh, say uh, I brought the example of we have two million uh, 
ethnic Armenians living in the US. We have another three million living in Russia. We have an, uh, close to a million in, in Western Europe. We have some in Iran. In the, so that, that presence uh, determines the way we, we look at the world. We have stakes, security concerns, and a long-term strategic interest in, in all those countries. We do, I mean, there's not, the, I mean, we're not that naive. We do understand, you know, when, uh, when Iran un comes under the, f the sanctions, of course, we do uh, abide by international sanctions. Although that's very painful, but let me tell you, I mean, small Armenia could have benefited from the Iranian market, but as a responsible member of the international community, as the country that works with the United States, we do abide by things. But uh, fundamentally, we do believe that we can embrace the best of all worlds. That's and can you get away with it? It's very difficult at time uh, of, of uh, acute crisis, conflict, and the rhetorics like the, uh, we hear in, in all major capitals. But we still believe that uh, because the fundamentals for us, those are not the gimmicks. We're not trying to... Uh, uh, do something behind the scenes and try to have, you know, uh, secret deals with this and that. No, we think but fundamentally because of those things we have, because the, the communities we have, and those communities we have, let me tell you something, the specifics of uh, Armenian community in, uh, in Marseille, in Los Angeles, in Ispahan, in Moscow, they are for some reason, uh, most of them, they've never been uh, part of, they've never been born in Armenia, but historically they maintain extremely strong links with Armenia. They, they travel, they have property, they invest, they, they, they start their day, day with watching Armenian news. So we have, I mean, this is a blessing and a curse, obviously, because uh, when you're an ambassador or consul general in Los Angeles, uh, in addition to doing uh, bilateral work, you also do deal with the community, with the political issues. Sometimes they make sure that you know that they're, di they're in disagreement with what, uh, 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 what the government does. Uh, so. My answer is, uh, is the following. Yes, we do have uh, good relations with Russia. Yes, we, we cooperate with them in, in security. But our uh, work with Russia and our regional powers is not, does not prevent us. On, on the contrary, we're very keen, eager, and vocal about that. We want to, to have uh, to even stronger relations with the US. We do admire uh, uh, you know, the values this, this nation is built on. We do have a very strong community, and we know that uh, a great deal of development of our country comes from Silicon Valley more than uh, uh, from any other capitals in the old world. Thank you. Um, I, I know our time's running out, but I just had to uh, do a plug for tourism in Armenia. I travel everywhere, and I was delighted to go um, on my holiday this summer to Armenia. Um, but I noted, no, noticed and noted, that most of the other tourists I met were Armenians traveling from the United States or elsewhere to Armenia with their children or their grandchildren. Um, why, why is that the case? Um, and why aren't we having more tourists? I found it a delightful, you know, non-Armenians traveling to, to your country. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a very valid point. 80% of tourism to Armenia is ethnic tourism. Uh, and that's uh, obviously it's like we keep on preaching to the choir. You know? uh, uh, we need to uh, embrace the world. We need to have uh, uh, more interactions. Uh, Armenia is a very welcoming country. It's an open country, uh, um, and uh, to most most appearances, we haven't done a good job in terms of reaching out and uh, and marketing the, uh, the, the, the tourism attractions of Armenia. It's a very ancient country with uh, perhaps uh, uh, per capita the largest uh, number of uh, uh, churches and monasteries, which are very uh, prehistoric. Early Christian heritage is very uh, present in Armenia. Uh, we uh, obviously uh, gastronomy and winemaking uh, are, are, are catching up. Uh, so the, the, the attractions are there. It's now that I think the, the ambassadors, consuls, and the trade uh, attaches have done a, a lousy job. We, we need to improve in that sense. So I, I take it as a criticism. But I, I, I do believe that uh, uh, US market is on tap market for us. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, groups that express interest, particularly the religious travel. I know we, the Bible Belt is very interested to go to Armenia. We need to, uh, it's, it's a far away country. Uh, to get to Armenia, it takes, uh, uh, on average, I'd say 16, 17 hours uh, if you get a good connection uh, with a stopover. I personally am now working with some of my uh, 
uh, colleagues from ANCA, I see them there, uh, uh, to, to, to see what, what is the possibility to have direct flights. And uh, if, I, if we manage to, to have, that will surely expand the number uh, of non-ethnic travelers uh, from um, both East Coast and West Coast. Uh, I, I thank you for that question. No, 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 I, and I was going to follow up. Isn't it true that um, the best brandy comes from Armenia? Um, I've, I've heard that um, our Winston Churchill had something to say about that. Back then, it was called cognac. You know, <laughs> that, that marvelous drink was introduced ah. to Armenia by, uh, by the French uh, a couple of centuries ago. And it was always called cognac, and it would... Uh, <laughs> Uh, historically, it would even challenge the, the, some of the French brands. Uh, to me, it is obviously, uh, and I'm being very objective, uh, it is best, it is better. Uh, 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 then, you know, Armenia was, uh, became part of Soviet Union. Uh, Soviets continued uh, using the, 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 the brand name Arat Cognac, uh, and uh, although the French were unhappy about that, but would Soviet Union pay attention to, like, so they continued to market it as cognac until Armenia became independent and uh, Pernod Ricard, which is the largest French uh, booze producer, whatever, uh, they did a very smart move. They bought the, uh, the production of Armenian cognac and, and uh, baptized it as brandy. <laughs> it is no longer cognac, uh, but it's a very good stuff and it continues to be very good stuff. Uh, uh, it's true that uh, uh, Stalin used to... Uh, he used to, on a, on a uh, monthly basis, uh, used to send uh, a couple of cases of Armenian cognac uh, uh, to uh, Winston Churchill, uh, who got addicted to it. As I mean, uh, we're, uh, and, and yet with uh, uh, ten cigars a day and a bottle of cognac, he, uh, his life expectancy was remarkably, you know, long. You know, is it? <laughs> so, so Armenian cognac does not. Shorten life, life expectancy. That's part of the marketing pitch I was going to. No. Uh, we do sell it in the U.S. Uh, I think uh, some of you, uh, uh, those who come and who frequent, who, who are part of our uh, celebrations, uh, uh, have a chance to, to taste it. You know, uh, Embassy of Armenia would be uh, more than happy to host a, a, a reception for World Affairs Council. Uh, now that we, you treat us like, like kings, you know, uh, for a cognac party. So consider it as an, as an, open, as an, as an open invitation. Um, I, uh, the, uh, thank you so much. We, we should um, open um, now questions from the audience. Um, Ambassador retired Laura Kennedy. Um, and uh, thank you for letting me go first. Um, <laughs> But um, I had the honor also of, uh, as I told the ambassador, of serving as um, uh, t a temporarily assigned charge at our brand new embassy in, um, in Armenia. When I was there, the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh was raging. So that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about, sir, um, after we have you know, resolved into that long sort of frozen conflict. Then recently, as, as I'm sure you know all too well, uh, conflict sort of bursts to life. I mean, um, casualties rising. So I wanted to ask if you could talk to us about this, this conflict that I think too few people are aware of, um, but it certainly has a huge, I know, importance for your country. So if you could, if you wouldn't mind, tell us, give us your perspective on where you think it is. And also if you could specifically uh, say uh, what you'd like to see the U.S. do beyond, say, serving as its role as one of the three co-chairs of the OSCE Nagorno-Karabakh Commission. Thank you so much, sir. Ms. Kennedy, thank you very much. Uh, it is a, uh, indeed a uh, very salient issue. Uh, uh, it's, you know, if you look at the political map of the world, there are a uh, few frozen conflicts. Some of them are, uh, uh, you, you can't, barely be called frozen conflict because they uh, they uh, uh, sporadic flare-ups as, as was the case in with Nagorno-Karabakh a little background into it you know uh, we're talking about uh, uh, a conflict between um, a population that uh, uh, of, a, of, a, of a country uh, part of the population of a country that took uh, 
its constitutional right, uh, according to Soviet constitution, uh, to declare self-determination. They went to uh, the, the polling stations and voted for uh, independence from uh, uh, Azerbaijan, according to the Soviet constitution. So when Soviet Union collapsed, uh, there were uh, a number of countries that emerged uh, out of that huge so socialist whatever union, uh, including Republic of Azerbaijan and Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh, which is uh, ethnic republic, uh, ethnically Armenian republic, that was uh, arbitrarily given to Soviet Azerbaijan by uh, Joseph Stalin. The people exercised the right for self-determination. As, as in response to that, uh, the government of the then Soviet Azerbaijan sent tanks and, and aircraft to bomb the civilian, you know, entirely only civilian population. It was a bloody war that claimed uh, tens of thousands of lives, uh, but uh, because there's a power of uh, self-determination, self-defense of the homeland versus mercenary type of logic, people defended their land uh, with the help of, uh, of Armenians, global Armenian community, uh, and, uh, and, and, and ever since for the last 25 years, that country was uh, de facto uh, independent, democratic, with electoral system, with presidents and parliament being elected, uh, still at odds fying, uh, facing uh, uh, another country, uh, ethnically uh, Azeri uh, Shia country, that wants to take, it, uh, uh, to take control over it. So how do you do that? In today's world where the self-determination is not very popular, like as we saw uh, what's going on with, with the Kurds and now with uh, Catalonia, and you know, people are, uh, the countries are allergic to potential changes in, you know, uh, separatism is not, we argue that the case of uh, NK is not, is not a separatism. It's a fact on the ground. Whether you like it or not, it is, it's an independent country that exists. It's a viable country. It's a democratic country, but according to uh, uh, you know, international watchdogs. And it does not want to go back and live under uh, 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 the dictatorship, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, a clan that, that runs uh, Azerbaijan for like, I don't know, 50 years or now, whatever. Uh, and that's, that's the situation. Uh, obviously, the world recognizes the fact that it's impossible to bring uh, uh, Azerbaijani rule over, over Nagorno-Karabakh, and there is the negotiation process that is going on. Unfortunately, there, is, uh, there continues to be a very uh, intransigent uh, uh, logic in, uh, in Azerbaijan. They think that with the uh, uh, fortune that they made on uh, oil boom, uh, that would immediately translate into uh, them gaining upper hand, which, uh, which they were uh, obviously mistaken. The situation continues to be uh, um, intoxicating the entire region. The entire region remains... Uh, uh, compartmentalized, you know, there is no trade, there is, you know, uh, transit routes, bypass Armenia and other kind. I mean, the situation is not viable. It's not good for, uh, especially if you abstract it to look at the greater Middle East with all of the other dangers that come from, uh, uh, from, the, from the South. You know, we, we call ourselves Southern Caucasus, but in fact, it's a greater Middle East. And uh, it's, a, it's a one hour flight from, from Yerevan to, uh, to Damascus and uh, Beirut and Tel Aviv and you know, so we are in, in that logic as well. I think obviously it is in Armenia's and region's best in interest to to cooperate to uh, to to sort out the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict in in a way which is acceptable to all. And uh, the three principles that we th think maintain that can be uh, incorporated, in, that can be factored in: territorial integrity, self-determination, and non-violence. And uh, there's uh, non-use of force. Uh, and those are the principles that are guiding, guiding principles for international mediators that US is, is part of. Uh, we would very much like, Armenia would very much like to see US con continued commitment presence in that negotiation process. Without US, that process would be lopsided. We, we welcome this honest broker's role that US has been playing all these years. It's not, sometimes it's tough. Sometimes US is, uh, is asking for uh, very serious and painful compromises, but we, we like that uh, impartiality to continue uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a presence that stabilizes, that brings uh, 
some kind of a hope uh, into that uh, stalled deadlock type of situation. Armenia has undertaken some sweeping reforms of its judicial and political system, such that this year it had its first uncontested elections. So from your perspective, what are the greatest uh, successes so far of those reforms, the challenges that still lay ahead, and the role for the U.S. in assisting with those reforms? U.S. has helped us to, uh, to build civil society. I mean, this is a very blunt, short answer. Uh, the, the vibrant... Uh, civil society with non-profits, uh, uh, outspoken and opinionated uh, non-profit organizations challenging the uh, official uh, viewpoint. And this is the, the thing that the wealth, that diversity that we created in, in our society. It is very important. It, 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 you, you take it for granted in, in US, but uh, for a country that comes from a totalitarian past, that is amazing achievement. Many of the countries in the same position as Armenia still don't have that. And it's, it's great, you know, diversity is, is a wealth that we should, and we are cherishing. Uh, um, obviously, we, ha we haven't uh, been able to build a, a perfect democracy. There's still some, uh, some flaws. Uh, we do have issues with corruption. We do have uh, issues with judicial system that we work on, and we, we uh, appreciate the, the assistance and technical expertise that we receive from, from US. Your, your friend, Ambassador Mills, has, has been very instrumental in some of those. Uh, uh, and uh, for us, uh, to, to survive in the region, which uh, you, you look around um, on, on a map, the countries surrounding Armenia do not show any, uh, they're not role models for, for democracy, in, uh, to, to, to be on a euphemistic side. Uh, uh, and yet, uh, the pressures are like, keep the, th the, the way the, the things are, you know. Uh, but my p personal feeling is that uh, in order to survive in that region, in order to, to continue to be uh, viable, and in order to, to, to mobilize uh, and, and have committed citizenry, we need to, to engineer uh, cutting-edge democratic uh, uh, institutions and country. Uh, that sounds a uh, very uh, weak argument uh, in the face of uh, ongoing conflicts and, you know, like... Uh, People tend to uh, have monolithic type of structure, but I think uh, in order to have uh, achieve a bigger commitment of citizens to to to, to statehood to uh, to future of the country, you need to to uh, to have them uh, all. Uh, you need their buy-in. Everybody uh, needs to be part of a, a political process, uh, and decisions should be taken in uh, in full transparency. I think that's that's the that's the direction we declared as our strategic declare. We, we work with the European Union, and uh, I mentioned the agreement that we'll be signing is also a step, step towards that. Uh, and and in terms of Armenia's, uh, where, where does Armenia belong? Our democratic choice suggests uh, what are our choices. We do work uh, in the region on security and other matters, but if you look at the democratic choices Armenia is taking. That's where our real uh, uh, heart is, you know. Um, um, I don't know whether that answered your question, but uh, perhaps I miss. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Hi, good evening, Ambassador. Thank you for your cogent remarks. My name is Chanel Little, and I represent the Nashman Center, the, I'm sorry, the Honey W. Nashman Center for Civic Engagement and Public um, Service at George Washington. And my question is, do you mind explicating the role Armenia employs in the regional stability of the Levantine Middle East, specifically the Armenian response to um, the Syrian refugee diaspora? Uh, this is a very painful issue. Uh, uh, in Syria, before the, uh, the war, we had uh, a vibrant uh, 250,000 strong community that was formed as a result of uh, genocide. People fled uh, uh, as the uh, Ottoman uh, army uh, was uh, chasing people into the forest. Those who survived made it to the uh, Aleppo and Damascus and other places. And uh, our community built incredibly strong presence. Uh, tens of churches, monasteries, uh, uh, schools, a university, all of that. And to see that all gone, you know, all of a sudden, that was a center of uh, a political thought, that was a center of, of culture and education for us. To see that all uh, uh, gone all of a sudden, you know, uh, that was a, a major loss for us. Uh, uh, there are three million Armenians that live in Armenia and seven uh, million Armenians that out are 
live outside Armenia. So that that gives you an idea how they how important diaspora is for for, for Armenia. So uh, in five years we saw that that uh, one of the big centers be, be decimated, you know, uh, literally, and uh, Armenia tried to to be helpful. I mean, it's the only country that maintained uh, a consulate in, in, in uh, war-torn Aleppo as the uh, war continued to, to ravage. So we issued passports and we tried to rescue and you know evacuate uh, uh, our brothers and sisters. Uh, so think about the Armenians and Syria is emblematic of the larger problem. The Middle East uh, is the birthplace of Christianity. Christians were present in the Middle East along with uh, 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 Muslims and, and, and Jews nonstop, you know, for, for millennia. So the, the trend of the last years is, the, uh, is that entire area uh, that had a couple of millions of Christians is, is being stripped of its Christian uh, heritage. We think that without Christian minority, and any other minorities, uh, as, as a matter of fact, we're very, we feel the same way about the Yazidis, uh, who were so brutally uh, uh, targeted by ISIS. We need that uh, without Christians in the Middle East, Middle East is a much more explosive place. Uh, minorities that would uh, water down a little bit of radicalism, you know, that they, they, the, the serve as translators, as vectors of uh, also Western civilization in the Middle East is critically important. So, uh, but the dilemma is now whether we encourage these people to go back to, uh, uh, to Syria. Uh, I mean, no government has the nerve or the heart to, uh, to tell people to go back to uh, uh, hell. Uh, and after, after having been uh, targeted by uh, extremist uh, radical rhetoric for, for many years, it's a very uh, difficult situation for us. Uh, we, we welcome uh, uh, U.S. efforts now, as, as I speak, uh, in the middle of this debacle, U.S. already thinking about the reconstruction effort. So uh, the sooner we become, uh, we, be we begin uh, talking about uh, uh, reconstruction, perhaps, uh, it, 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 it may become uh, viable at some point. So. Um, let's, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.